Good evening. Go ahead and turn in, in your Bibles to Micah, the book of Micah. That's where we're going to be looking tonight. Hopefully, we're going to cover all of it tonight. That depends largely on Gerald. So, Hey, if it's up to me, it, it's not going to be a problem to cover <laughs> seven chapters, I assure you. We will go through this quick. <laughs> so right now, we're in the middle of, and really, we've been doing this the whole time we started this quarter, but... We're in the middle of going through a lot of prophets, and so we're going to be going through Micah tonight. Um, what has been one of the main, well, I guess what are some of the themes that we've covered through the prophets so far? Judgment's coming. Repent. What else? Hope, yes. I think those are all exactly right. Maybe there's some other things I'm not thinking of, but... We have judgment because of their sin, because of their unfaithfulness. It's been described different ways. Uh, we have that they need to repent. But we also know that, you know, God, at least God knows that's not going to happen. And then we have hope on the other side of judgment, right? Uh, and then I think we have maybe dual hope there, right? So more maybe mm -hmm. of a, it sounds weird to say, more of an immediate hope and then mm -hmm. they'll come back to the land. Not as immediate as they'd like probably, but then we have a long-reaching hope. Um, looking well into the future to the Messiah. So, surprise, surprise, when we go through Micah, we're going to see a lot of the same kind of things. Now, when you look at the first verse in chapter 1 of Micah, uh, what are some things that we learn? Who is Micah, or maybe, I should, yeah, let's talk about this verse. Who is Micah talking to? So he's talking to Israel. And? Yes. <laughs> And Judah. So you notice how there it says concerning who and who at the end of verse one. Concerning who and who. Right. Okay. Well, why would, like, how do we know if it's saying Samaria and Jerusalem? It's talking about Israel and Judah. They're the capital cities, right? So when it's saying concerning Samaria and Jerusalem, I don't think it's literally only meaning those cities, right? It's talking about the nations that those cities represent. So talking about Israel and Judah. Now, I would say this is probably in some ways uh, a departure from most of the prophets we've looked at, because most of them have been dealing just with Israel, and this one's going to bring in Judah pretty heavily. All right? It's going to be dealing with Judah quite a bit. So we're going to see that as we go through. Um, now, this might not be as obvious, but I'm going to bring it up. When is Micah delivering this message? We know who he's delivering it to, but when is he delivering this? So here it mentions Jotham, or Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, have we talked about those kings already? I think we did with Isaiah, right? So I think with Isaiah, Isaiah covers this period. And so what you have here in Micah is Micah is going to be a contemporary of Isaiah. Now, again, his message in some ways is, are, are going to be similar, but also going to be different, right? So he's going to be doing a lot with Judah. Anything you want to say about that before we get into the stuff? No, uh, you know, as you said, with the... Uh with uh, the message here, it's going to be very comparable to the last three uh, prophets that we discussed. That's right. uh, Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah. So not a lot's going to change. It's going to have basically the same themes. That's right. I think what we'll see, and again, we'll get some more to this, but I think we're going to see we're going to maybe see different focuses in those themes. So when he's talking about judgment, and when he's talking about what they've done, he's going to be focusing on specific people where maybe those people were brought up before, but we're going to spend more time on those people. Uh, I think when we get to the Messianic stuff, I think we're going to see that he maybe brings up a couple of things the other ones did. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're going to see some uh, some differences here as well, but obviously lots of similarities. Some, some new hints regarding some the hints. Uh, Messiah. Yes, that's right. All right, so let's start, and we're going to read verses 2 through 9. So this is, again, this is setting the tone for the book. Hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention to earth and all that is in you. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place, and he will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split wide open, like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high, high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. And I will pour 
down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images will be beaten, uh, be beaten into pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire, and all her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. For this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. For her wound is incurable and it has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people to Jerusalem. Okay, so that was lengthy, but I think there's several things you're going to get from this. So first of all, it says the Lord is coming, right? The Lord is coming and he's coming to bear witness against them. And then when it describes how, he, how he's coming, what does this sound like? Is it going to be a pleasant visit? No, right? So I, I love some of the imagery here. The mountains will melt under him. The valleys will be split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down from a steep place. So you have, you know, his fury is so intense. Mountains are melting, right? And it's like, oh, that must be pretty bad. The high, He talks about treading on the high places, making them low. Uh, why is this going to happen? That's right. So we see this answered, uh, I guess it would be in verse 7, probably most clearly. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. And then a couple lines later, all her idols I will lay waste. All right, so we have idolatry. But I think the line in between is also maybe something we should think about as well. Mm -hmm. It says all her wages shall be burned with fire. What do you think that means when it's indicating her wages will be burned with fire? What do they do with the idols? Let me ask that. They sacrifice them. Sure. So they sacrifice to them. They worship them. What do you think they're doing with their wages? Yeah, I think that. But I also think they're probably worshiping their wages too. I think they're greedy people. I think they're people that are selfish and they're looking to you know benefit themselves however they can. I think what the Lord's saying is. All these things that you think might be benefiting you, that you're pouring all this into, I'm going to get rid of it. It's going to be gone. I'm going to take it away. I'm going to destroy it, and they'll be taken away with it. We'll see that idea uh, as chapter 2 opens, mm. as far as the way the, the wealthy, the powerful, how they prey upon the, Lord, uh, the, the poor mm -hmm. of the land and uh, have no, uh, no concept of, of justice. No. And so they're they're gaining, but it's off the back of the poor, uh, off the back of the needy. And so he's gonna he's gonna strip them of their wages. That's right. We get to verse eight. I think we get maybe a little bit of commentary, and we'll get this throughout the book. We get a little bit of commentary from Micah. How does he feel about this? Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, but that's probably to be expected. I mean. For someone who cares about the people, who cares about God's word, he's looking at saying the people aren't doing God's word. And because of this, so he cares about God's word. That's distressing him. But then because of this, God's going to wipe them out or at least you know, carry them off. And that's going to distress him too because he cares about the people. So you can see this effect is going to have on Micah. And like I said, we'll see this at least a few times through this text. Uh, I think in verse 9 is where I point this out already. But I think we get one of the differences maybe. And that we have with the other prophets because what does it say in verse 9 as far as who we're going to start talking about maybe a little bit more in some ways Judah. Judah, right? So we've seen this kind of thing with Israel it's not surprising with Israel but now it's come to Judah now it's come to Judah, right? And so this is going to be one of those things where I think the focus in this letter overall is going to be just a little bit different than prophets we talked about before we can see it's going to be focused a little bit more on Judah than it was on Israel uh, than it was before when it was focused on Israel. And for Israel, her wound is in Kirbo. Cur That's right. At this point. They're, you know, they've, uh, the, the writing's on the wall for them. Mm -hmm. It's coming. Yeah. But Judah, you know, Judah is, you know, not as, not as progressed as Israel, but it's, you know, they're, they're going down that same path, that same course as Israel. Mm -hmm. Anything else in the first nine verses there? Mm -hmm. All right, I I might sum up the rest of chapter one. Are you okay? Or do you want to read something? Well, no. You know, all I was going to point out, like with verses uh, ten through fifteen, seems to be a play on words here, from the best I understand. 
what Micah is doing, and, he, and he's, he's chosen some some villages, some towns there, and they're, the name of the towns have have meaning, like Gath, for instance. He says, uh, tell it not in Gath. Weep not at all. Well, the meaning of Gath is tell town, and yet what is he saying? Tell it not. <laughs> uh, what is it? Uh, Zayan in verse 11. The inhabitants of Zayan do not come out. So its original meaning is march town. And he's telling them, do not march, mm -hmm. essentially. And so, you know, you could go down through here and, and uh, describe all those in the same way. Uh, so this is, a, this is a bad scene, basically. Verse 16 says, make yourselves bald and cut, cut off your hair for your children, for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle for they shall go from you into exile. So things are bad, not only in Israel, but in Judah. So bad that what's the, what's the path that they're heading down? We know Israel is going into captivity, but what about Judah? They're going to go too. Maybe not in the current state, you know, the people that's currently living won't, but what about their children? What about their grandchildren? You see this, the same idea. It's just, you know, it's down the road a little piece, but they're heading the same path as, as the northern tribes of Israel. That's right. And I would say this as well. So what you were talking about there, the, the play on words is mm -hmm. really interesting, right? So the idea is, I, I think maybe I'm wrong, but it's like this is something that you'll want to keep hidden mm -hmm. that you don't want the nations around to know about. because It's, it's a be shameful bad. thing. It's gonna be, yes, it's mm -hmm. going to be shameful. It's going to be really bad. And then I think there's an interesting phrase in verse 15. So verse 15, the very end there, says, The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. I think this might be an interesting phrase because I think Adullam, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that was one of the Canaanite cities that was destroyed by Joshua when they came into the land. Um, what do we know, if this is true, I think it is, but if this is true, then what do we know about what the Israelites were doing to the Canaanites. What, what purpose did God have in having the Israelites push out the Canaanites? Is a dual purpose. What was one purpose? That's how they're going to inherit the land. That's how they're going to inherit the land. They want them to be corrupted by their idol worship. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's right. And one thing we see in this as well, so we see it's fulfilling a promise, but we also see God is saying, I'm pronouncing judgment on the people in the land. And I'm pronouncing judgment on them because they don't care about my law. Now, they don't have the same kind of law the Israelites had, but they do have a law, and they're not keeping it. And I think it's interesting that he might be using the same kind of idea here with Israel, saying, you're not keeping my law, so what am I going to do? I'm going to drive you out of the land. Uh, and using one of their past victories to talk about one of their future defeats. Well, you know, in the book of De Deuteronomy, Moses warned Israel about that very thing. You know, God is using them as an instrument of judgment as they go into Canaan to pronounce judgment on them, to cast them utterly from the land. But if Israel was not faithful, what would happen to them in turn? Same thing. And I think that that's exactly what, what you're saying. That's mm -hmm. that's what's unfolding here. That's exactly right. They could live in Canaan, but they couldn't be Canaanites. That's exactly what they could become. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, you ready for chapter two? Mm -hmm. All right, so in chapter two, Gerald talked about this a second ago. What do we see in the first few verses? We're not, we're, I think chapter two, we're not going to take much time to read a lot here, but what do we see in the first few verses? How are the people described? They're devising iniquity. What else? Yes. And what you see is, is that in this as well, what, I, I think this is funny. Verse 1, come up devising iniquity. They work evil on their beds. When morning dawns, they perform it, right? Mm -hmm. So the kind of evil they're doing, is this kind of like a reluctance? Like, I guess i got to do something bad today. No. Mm -hmm. They're eager, right? They're like, they can't wait to do this. They're staying up all night devising this plan, yes. and then they carry it out the next day. As soon as they can. As soon as they can. As soon as they can, they carry it out. And so, in talk, you like to talk about they're trying. It's not like these plans are not affecting anybody, right? They're doing things that are going to hurt other people. They're going to hurt their fellow brethren. 
And so what God says is he says this. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't know. I guess it, it'd be verse five. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. So what God is saying here is like you're devising disaster upon each other. And so what God is going to do is he's going to do the same thing to them, right? He's going to bring disaster upon them. And so uh, anything you want to say about this, those verses there? No, not really. You know, verse 6 oh, follows I that. I say verse 3 is what it was. Verse 3 says, Therefore says the Lord, Behold, against this family I'm devising disaster. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So they're devising disaster against each other, and the Lord's devising against them. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, verse 2, the end of it, you know, they're oppressing a man in his household, a man in his inheritance. You know, here, these are these are the, the affluent that's able to carry this out, those that have power, those that can carry these things out. And they're praying, I mean, they're cannibalizing, you know, their own people here is what's taking place. Yes. Then we get to verse 6. What do they say in verse 6? Don't want to hear it. So verse 6, do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. <laughs> yeah. Should this be said, O house of Jacob? Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to, to him who walks uprightly? But lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustworthy, uh, trustingly with no thought of war. So here... They look at it and they say, is there anything to be worried about? The people are thinking, is there anything to be worried about? No. Yeah. I mean, this is not something to worry about. In fact, I'm tired of you talking about this, right? Stop preaching this. This is not going to happen. And then what, and, and I, I do notice this as well. Should this be said, O house of Jacob? This is God's question to them. Should this be said? Should they hear about these things? They should. And the reason is, is because they have risen up as an enemy. And at the very end there, it talks about they've risen up as an enemy, I think, against God, against each other, right? It mentions that, but against God as well. And they have no thought for the consequences it's going to bring. So with no thought of war, right, with no thought of the consequence, the damage that this is going to bring upon themselves, they're willfully ignorant in all of this. And they're not worried about it. And then you see in verse 7, he, he gives the contrast there. He says, this is what you're doing. But what would the Lord do if they were doing right, or if they walked upright? That's right. So do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly. And so they shouldn't have a reason to be upset about the words if they were doing what was right. They're upset, and they don't think things are going to happen, but they will. You know, verse 6 where it says, uh, one should not preach such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You know, the, the problem with both Israel and Judah was that they adapted this mindset of, of absolute. As far as, like Israel, we we're God's chosen people. You know, that's just a fixed thing. We can't, we can't suffer disgrace. We can't suffer shame. And of course, in Jerusalem, would they say, oh, we've got the temple. This is the place where God dwells. Again, another absolute. You know, never mind that they're not obeying God. You know, everything is just for show, as we're going to cover here in just a little bit. Uh, but their hearts are far from them. But they, you know, their thinking is in absolute terms to where, you know, they are his people and he dwells in the temple. Therefore, nothing can happen to them. They're protected. That's right. Yeah, they'll find out that's not the case. He's going to call on a lot of that, like you're saying. All right, I'm going to look down at verse 11. So they said, we don't want you to preach to us about these things. In verse 11, there's a man who says, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink. And what do they want to do with this man who's preaching this kind of thing? Well, I, I, I take it to mean that they do want to hear this man, yes. right? So when it says, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, it's like, okay, yeah, let's talk about that. Let's, talk about, let's not talk about judgment. Let's talk about this. They'll accept him as a preacher. So how do you think the Lord's going to react to that? To people that want that kind of preaching, don't want the truth. He's going to lead them out of the land because of it. Okay. 
you have anything you want to say before chapter three? Mm -mm. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll, yes. I'll make it that way today. Oh, yeah. And that's a natural reaction, right? It's natural to be like, well, I don't want to be wrong. I think nobody really wants to be wrong necessarily. But sometimes you'd be open to being wrong, and they're not. That's right. They don't want laws that restrict them. They only want laws that benefit them. And uh, that's what, again, that's what they're trying to do with God, is they're saying, God, the things that you want us to do that we don't want to do, we're not going to do it. But then if there are things that you maybe promises you've made us to protect us and stuff, oh, yeah, we'd like to have that. But that's not how it works, right? But that's how, that's how they're treating it. All right, anything else before chapter 3? Okay. All right, now, uh, probably for sake of time, I'm not going to read as much as I was wanting to read in chapter 3. There's a lot of really good stuff in chapter 3. Mm -hmm. where he, Who he's talking to and what he accuses them of and all kinds of stuff. And so I'm probably going to read just one section out of here, maybe two, because I'm greedy. But in the first four verses, who is he talking to? Yeah, the heads and the rulers, right. So he's talking to them, and he's saying, you need to know justice. And the reason you, and I, I don't know how that's meant to be. I don't know if it's meant to be, you need to have a knowledge of justice or saying, you're about to figure out what justice looks like. But the reason is, is because they're not showing any justice. What they're doing is they're abusing their power. They've abused the people. They don't care about the people. And so the Lord says, justice will be coming to you. And, and, and they'll find that out. Anything in those first four? You know, verse two, you hate the good and love the evil. I mean, that sums it up right there, I think. We've seen that phrase a couple of times in the mm -hmm. prophets. Um, and it, I, I, I think it's a really good phrase because it talks about how backwards they have it. Right. right? You call evil good and good evil. And, uh, and then here you love uh, evil and you hate the good. And they just have everything backwards. Let me get to verse five. So in verse five, I, I, I do want to read that one. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. <laughs> so, who's he talking about? The prophets. Yeah, mm -hmm. the prophets, that's right. And so, and, and why do you say they're false prophets? Uh, because, well, the previous chapter, uh, they were only... Say that judgment's coming because there will be a disgrace. But they have led the people astray into idolatry and yeah. into the sea. Are they speaking what God wants to hear? No. no. They're only speaking the kinds of things that are going to benefit them. So when the people are taking care of the priests, or the, sorry, the prophets, they're like, oh, good things are going to happen, right? Peace. But then when things aren't going so well for them and the people aren't taking care of them, they're like, oh, bad things are going to happen. We better straighten up. And really they're saying, I want my things back. Right? I want profits for back. hire. Yeah, profits for hire. That's mm -hmm. right. Um, now, what is going to be the consequence of this? They're using their position. They're using their power to, they're, they're using their power to get what they want. So what's God going to make of their power? They're going to lose it, Right? He's going to put them, he describes as putting them in darkness. They're not going to be able to see anymore. But I think something is interesting. So you look down at verse uh, 8. I think, again, we get maybe a tiny, and I hope I have this right, but I think we get a tiny picture into something that Micah is saying himself. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and might, to declare Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So who's exempt from this? Micah is. Why? That's right. And so, again, I think all this is tied with what we were talking about just a minute ago about uh, they're saying, stop preaching this. He's like, but I have to because this is what God wants. And because of that, he's still going to be, well, blessed by God where the others are not going to, not going to be. Anything you say about that? Is six and seven, is that a forecast of the years of silence? Is that a look in the head to when there would be no? I would not be surprised. No dreams, no visions, no, yes. no nothing, no communication at all. 
I think it could be. I wonder if this is one of those passages, again, that has like a dual meaning where it might be an immediate effect. Is like, look, you're not going to prosper immediately or semi-immediately. And then one where you, you're talking about like with years of silence too. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it could be that. But. All right. Verse, verses 9 through 12. So 9 through 12, who's he addressing once again? Heads. That is right. Okay. Now, I think what I want to focus on here, so again, he calls out their corruption. But look at their attitude uh, at the end of verse 11. So, well, let's read all verse 11. Its head give judgment for, uh, its heads give judgment for a bribe. We talked about that a second ago. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Which, by the way, you remember how earlier I said the money, uh, so he was talking about idols and he talked about money. He's going to get rid of the money. This is why, because they're valuing it. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? Mm -hmm. No disaster shall come upon us. <laughs> so I don't know if they really believe this or not, but they dare to say it, right? They dare to say the Lord is on their side when they're using all these situations for their own gain. And they know what they're saying is not the Lord's will. Well, they're still going through the ceremonial acts. Mm -hmm. They're still carrying those out. They look the role in that aspect. Yeah, Just don't look at this other aspect mm -hmm. when they're cheating their neighbor or, or whatever. Yeah, so there's an empty uh, empty commitment there. Yeah, well, I mean, that's just uh, blatant hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. That's right. Anything on chapter 3? Chapter 3 is a great one because of the, again... Uses pretty strong language, calls them down a lot. Anything they want to bring and, up. And you know, when we get toward the end of the book, it's almost as if we have a court scene. So God is building his case yes. here, as it were. As we're going through these chapters, he's building his case against, well, you know, the, the case is already made against Israel. You know, they're it's fixed. Mm -hmm. We know what's coming to them. But Judah, he's making his case against Judah as well. That you know, captivity is coming for them if they continue down their path, and they they're deserving of it. Yeah, they're absolutely deserving of it. And that's a great point. I probably didn't make as big of a deal out of this as I should have at the beginning. But when it says, "Let," so this is chapter one, verse two, "Let the Lord God be a witness against you." So from the very beginning, I think you're exactly right. From the very beginning, he's saying, "Here's my case against you," and then, like you're saying later on, we'll get to a point where he's like, "Okay, what's your response? What's your rebuttal to this? How are you going to mm -hmm. answer that?" Uh, but you're exactly right. The whole time he's he addresses the people as a whole, and then he starts addressing leaders, uh, both of a physical nature, but then also leaders of a spiritual nature, and he's making his a case against them in every in every way. That's a really good point. Anything else through chapter three? I don't know if this is sci-fi or not. But Jesus, Jesus said, uh, "Walked to, to some leaders and mm -hmm. said, you devour widows' houses.'" Is that a mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> I think so. And I'll I'll try to come back to that later. There's a verse later where I think it's very similar kind of idea with how God is addressing the people here and how Jesus will address the Pharisees. If I remember, or we get the we get to it. We have for chapter four. Yeah, we're we're about to change gears a little bit. Yes. No, you're exactly right. All right, so let's read. Uh, are you okay reading the first seven verses here? You give that? Sure, sure. Right. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that he, uh, we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away, 
and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame and I will and the lame I will make the remnant, and those who were cast off a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth forevermore. So I think here we're getting a picture of God's people and what they would look like one day. You notice here they have the phrase the latter days. What do you think the phrase the latter days is referring to? What does it often refer to? Maybe I should say that. Yes. So I think we would, that I think it's exactly right. I think that period of time is what we would call maybe the messianic era, right? Mm -hmm. The time of Jesus. And this is going to come about in the latter days. And you look at some of the things here. I think one of the things I want to focus on is what they say in verse 2. Because this is just amazing, right? It's going to be completely different what we see right now. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and may walk in his paths. Just what we were talking about earlier, the difference in attitude when you're confronted with mm -hmm. truth. You know, in the past, they're, they're, you know, they're shirking it. But here, what's their approach? They want it. They're hungering for it. They're thirsting for it. They're wanting it. They're desiring it. That's right. So his people are going to be the type that yearns to be with him and to do what he wants them to do. What is this going to lead to for the people? Peace. Peace. Security, right? You have this, this imagery of they're, they're taking uh, weapons of war and making <laughs> things that will uh, eventually provide for them. Uh, and so, again, you have this idea of there's not going to be any more war, any more strife. They will be secure. Uh, love verse 5 as well. For all the peoples, each in the name of its God, uh, all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So you have this people and they are committed. Now, when we get to 6 and 7, well, do you have anything to say in the first five? Mm -hmm. You get to 6 and 7. What kind of people are we calling? The outcasts. That's right, the lame, the outcasts. Are those usually the people that you're like, oh, I, I want them to be part of my group? You wouldn't think so, right? Uh but we talked about this in Isaiah, didn't we? How with the Savior in Isaiah, when we got the picture of him, wasn't quite what we expected. And it's here with the nation. It's like, it's not quite what we're expecting. But those are going to be the people that the Lord's going to call. And I don't want to get too much into it now, but when Jesus comes around, we're going to understand why he goes to people like this. I'll just say it's because those are the ones that need him, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that need him. And they recognize and want him. Yes, that's right. They recognize their needs, so they want him. All right. Anything you want to say about that? Mm -mm. Okay. All right. I'm probably going to sum up the rest of the chapter here because we got 12 minutes left. <laughs> we got to go. <laughs> yeah, we're halfway. So, all right. Um, so I think maybe a verse worth pointing out is in verse 10. He talks about, uh, for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go where? To Babylon. All right, that's probably going to be something worth pointing out. We know they're going to be taken away, but now we know where. Uh, I believe we mentioned this before, but right now Babylon is it a major threat. Mm -mm. Not yet, but again, this is the Lord saying this is what's going to happen. Right now, I think Syria is the main threat, mm -hmm. uh, but Babylon will be by the time these things are taken uh, taking place. Um. I think all I'll say about the rest of it is that you see nations trying to rise against them. And what the Lord is going to do is he's going to have a remnant that he protects. And again, I think we're, I think this could have a dual meaning in some ways. I think it could be a physical remnant, but I think also the idea is maybe you have a spiritual remnant that comes from the physical. Uh, and just like you have a spiritual kingdom that comes from the physical kingdom uh, of Israel, I think he's on the same kind of idea here with that. Those are the ones he's going to protect. Those are loyal to him. You know, the, the pain of captivity must come before restoration mm -hmm. comes. You know, that, that seems the, you know, that's kind of what I get out of, out of uh, verse 10 there that, you know, it's going to be painful, but it's not going to be permanent. Right. Yes. I know I said we need to hurry, but I want to read the first six verses of chapter five. So let's do it. Now, most of your troops, O daughter of troops, siege is laid against us. With a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the nation, uh, be among the clans of Judah, 
From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. All right, I'm going to pause there for a second. Okay, we're talking about we're talking about this figure. Who does that sound like? Sounds like the Messiah, right? Sounds like Jesus. Again, I talked about we get a little bit more information here. We know where he's coming from. Where? From Bethlehem, right? So now we have something, again, something to, to keep in our minds, to latch on to, to see, is this going to happen, right? The Babylon thing. Is this going to happen? Bethlehem thing. Is it going to happen? Isaiah said, coming from a virgin. You know. Yes, that's a good point. You know. Right. So we're getting these details along the way, and from different people, too. Mm -hmm. We're getting these details along the way. It's like, okay, is all this going to happen? It's like, well, we'll see, won't we? But and, yes, it does. And who is this? I mean, is this just going to be another prophet? Uh, yeah, no. This is this is the one from of old. Right? Yeah. This is from the ancient of days. What do you think that means? Yes. Well, who fits that description? God does, right? That's the one who fits that description. So when we're talking about these kind of promises, we're talking about the like, you know, promises going all the way back. We're talking about the the being going all the way back of ancient of days. That's great. I'm glad you mentioned that. And then what we see, and I'll probably sum up some of this actually, what we see is he's going to shepherd his flock in the strength of his Lord. So he's going to be a shepherd. Jesus describes himself as a shepherd. Mm -hmm. And he describes, here it's described as in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And what they're going to do is they're going to dwell secure, right? They're going to have peace, which again, we saw some of that earlier, but they're having peace specifically, specifically because he's the one taking care of them in the name of the Lord. All right, anything through those first six verses there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the rest of the chapter, what we have, I think, is described here is that the remnant are going to be spread among the nations, but the Lord will make sure that they will be triumphant over their enemies. And then he, I think what we have at the end is that he's going to execute, verse, last verse, in anger and wrath I'll execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. So we're talking about this remnant here. This is why I said this earlier. I think what we have in the remnant is those who are obedient, those who are faithful. Those he will protect. Those he will raise up over the other nations. And the ones that do not obey, judgment will come for them. Right? Wrath and judgment will come for them. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah. All right. Okay. So chapter 6. So this is where you're talking about the kind of the courtroom mm -hmm. scene, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we do need to read some of this. Uh, let's read the first five verses here. You want me to read those for you? Go ahead. Yeah. We'll just swap that out. First five. Yeah, first five, that's fine. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hear, hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak the king of Moab devised and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. So, I, I love, so first of all, like you said, he's calling to attention, hear the indictment of the Lord. So hear the accusation, right? And then and, verse 3. And whose servant is witnesses? Oh, Creation. Yeah. yeah. The mountains. I mean, how, how long do mountains endure? <laughs> yeah. So they're long witnesses mm -hmm. from the time they've come into the land until now. They're witnesses. Verse 3. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. I love this. Because these people are viewing this as a weariness, right? They're, they're viewing God's law and saying, oh, do we have to do this? Do we have to keep up all these things? He said, how the weird do you? In fact, what has God done for them that he mentions here? Yeah. He's taking care of them. Like you said, brought them out of captivity. He's kept them safe. So he mentions the situation of Balak and Balaam, right? Balak wanted to curse them, but God did what through Balaam? Bless them, right? So he's brought them out of captivity. He's blessed them. He's taken care of them all along the way. What has he done to weary them? Nothing. 
And yet this is how they view it. So then you look at verses six through eight. With what shall I, I think this is a response, wouldn't you think? A response mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So they're saying, well, what do you want? You want sacrifices? I can, actually, I can't tell this is the people or maybe Micah here. But either way, the question is the same. Does God just want sacrifices? Mm -mm. No, right? It's not that he just wants sacrifices. Verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So it's not that he just wants sacrifices. He doesn't want to be sacrificed. In fact, you see how intense they went with the sacrifices. So they increased numbers, but then not only did they increase numbers, they increased what the sacrifice was. They said, do you want my firstborn? And God says, no. What I want is I want you to do justice and to be kind. And be humble. And those are the things that God desires. Those are he, things that the Lord desires. He wanted their hearts. Mm -hmm. So this is where I was talking about. Jesus says something similar to the Pharisees, doesn't he? When he's accusing the Pharisees of caring so much about certain details of the law, he says that they, they well, it, it's very similar to this, right? He said that they should be, uh, you deny justice and mercy and, I forgot the third thing. Do you remember the third thing? Humble. Humble. Yeah, what Jesus says, though. I don't think oh. he says humbleness. He says justice and mercy and. Yeah, I was, I was thinking ahead here. <laughs> you caught me on that. Sorry about that. Um. Well, this is going to it. Well. You still want to change your ways. Yeah. I just wish I could remember that. It's going to bother me. They haven't been treating people justly. So that's why he says do just. They haven't been merciful. We already read all mm -hmm. this. And then they have not walked in humble with God because they're worshiping other idols. So this is why Micah's addressing those three things. That's right. Okay. Well, I'll try to go back and find out some other point. But I can't do it right now, apparently. Okay, so the end of chapter 6. What he does is he points out their corruption and their greediness again. So what is he, what is he going to do because of their corruption and because of their greediness? What is he going to do to them? What are their efforts going to bring forth? Oh, good. Matthew 23, uh, verse 23, it looks like. Okay. Says, what do you strive with Pharisees, hypocrites, be faithful, and have a human, and have the weightiest matters of all, justice, mercy, and faith. Faith. These you ought to have done without living in the other Yeah, that's an easy one to forget, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's complicated. So, Yeah, thank you. Yeah, justice, and mercy, and faith. So you have, like I said, a trio there, but you're exactly right. What he's saying is they're not doing what I'll be doing, and they're forgetting the more important things. So let me, let me just, as much as I can, try wrap this up. Uh, so he points out their corruption and greediness. And so what he says is that all their efforts are going to basically be in vain. The things they try to do to get gain, not going to work anymore. So he's going to undercut all that because of the way they've acted. Now... When you get to chapter 7, I think what you see, and again, I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick. But in chapter 7, I think you see that Micah is distressed because of this. And what you see here is that in verse 7, he talks about all these things going on. And he's distressed, but he says, But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the salvation of my God. My God will hear me. Again, this is what the people ought to have been doing the whole time. Micah stands in contrast to the, the common people where everybody's devising against everybody else. Even, you know, it describes, uh, you know, a person's wife and their children are even devising against their own family, right. you know. But here, what is, how does Micah stand? He stands with God. He That's will right. trust in the Lord. 
And you have, uh, yeah, I, I think there's several aspects of this are contrary to people, right? Mm -hmm. So they're wanting, 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 and they were trying to get now. And he says, I'm going to wait for the Lord. I'm going to look to the Lord. I'm going to wait for the Lord. They're not looking to the Lord. They're looking to see what they can grab. And they're seeing how quickly they can grab it. Micah stands in contrast to them. So, phrase wait for me to serve. Mm -hmm. I will serve the Lord. Yes. I don't mean sit back and wait. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you're right. All right, so then 14 through 17, I think you have a plea here uh, for God to again shepherd and bless his people. A prayer. Yes, you have a prayer. And it's for the sake of his name before the nations, which again sounds kind of like Moses before, but I think that's what we have here. And then he ends it with talking about the Lord's compassion and mercy. So this again has been a book about judgment, but he's going to talk about their compassion and mercy, or the Lord's compassion and mercy at the end for his remnant. You know, he had every right to completely destroy this people, but he doesn't. He he's going to punish them, mm -hmm. but at the same time, he's going to restore them. He's going to bring them back. And so we see his, his mercy in that. That's right. All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.